Hey guys, and uh, we hope uh, everybody out there is doing really well these days. You might recall that in the earlier stages of this year, we brought out a documentary whose purpose was to look at the history of major Shannon air disasters between 1946 to 1961, 15 year period. We eventually got the documentary out uh, in the February, March uh, timeframe, and we were to say the least, delighted with the level of response and interest that uh, we received from viewers on this. So uh, thank you very much for this. The documentary wasn't uh, long out when we realised that there were a number of critical uh, flaws that someday we'd want to redress. Uh, in the middle of the year, I got involved with uh, two, by my standards, uh, major documentaries uh, uh, concerning a diving expedition to RMS Lusitania. These two documentaries in turn pushed the revised uh, Shannon Air disaster video on the back burner. So it's only in the last couple of weeks that I've got around to looking at the project again and uh, trying to cast it in a new light. The, the first deficiency in the original documentary was sound quality, which I was never totally happy with. Uh, so this is the easier part. Uh, this just required getting new sound capture technology and moving ahead with that. The second challenge was uh, something on a slightly grander scale. We felt that all along the deficiency in the documentary was the absence of an interview with somebody who first of all had uh, an aviation background and secondly had a very, very deep knowledge of the history of uh, air crashes in this period. By sheer luck we found a gentleman by the name of Tony Canan and who really has gone on with his uh, generosity of his time to make an enormous difference to this endeavour. So we have Tony Canan to thank so much, so profoundly for everything he has done with this interview. I'm convinced that when you see the interview, you will know exactly what I'm talking about and it does really stand out. Uh, the other aspect of the project was we wanted to restructure it into uh, building blocks. Uh, in other words, you're going to look first at a short uh, introduction to the history of the airport itself and how it came into being. Secondly, we're going to do the interview with Tony, which takes about uh, 25 minutes. The third block is the actual chronological summaries of the uh, aviation uh, disasters and uh, the crash sites and where you might find them to this day. Finally, we wrap up with an epilogue and some final thoughts on the whole thing. So uh, just like the first time, uh, we would encourage anybody who has got interest or uh, undiscovered facts uh, on these air disasters to come forward. We're going to leave a phone number and an email. You can also put commentary at the end of this uh, YouTube video. You're, you're more than welcome. The YouTube channel is uh, free to subscribe to. Um, we cover a lot of history, uh, aviation, uh, some music, so it's a mixed bag. Not sure whether you like it or not, but it's a free subscription. So just make yourself known. Don't forget, hit a like and subscribe. Uh, in the meantime, uh, hopefully I'll hear from people down the line and uh, you never know where this goes. So in the meantime, wherever you are, uh, take care of yourself, uh, be safe and talk to you soon. Starting with the airport's first fatal crash in 1946 and ending with the last in September 1961, 
I have produced this short documentary to remember these lost flight crews and passengers. At its heart, Shannon is an international airport which has had to battle for its very existence in good times and in bad. So tonight, we travel through the mists of time and recall these events which have led to the relative safety of aviation today, which we all take for granted. For anybody living in this region who has recollections of these long ago events, please feel free to get in touch and to leave your comments. To everyone who has so far contributed to this documentary, I express my gratitude. In the early 1930s, Shannon's development started out with three grass runways. In 1935, the Irish government took the initiative to commission a survey to find a suitable location for a base to operate seaplanes and land planes to service transatlantic flights. Construction commenced in 1935 and into 1936 with extensive drainage of this marshy site. The thinking at the time was that seaplanes would dominate transatlantic flights and land planes would connect to Europe. As people may already know, Foyne's seaplane base was located on the opposite bank of the estuary. In the early phases of survey work, the celebrated American aviator Charles Lindbergh was brought in to advise on planning. While presented as an American icon, clouds would soon gather over his reputation. Lindbergh would go on to get involved with the Nazi party through their shared interest in eugenics and purity of racial reading. American Overseas Airways operated the first scheduled flight and Shannon was on its way as a transit point for the famous and not so famous of the day. The main runway in Shannon in those days was 0623 or a rough east-west by compass points. Strangely enough, Modern maps show the alignment 0724 and this is explained by the creation of a new main jet runway. Numerous cross runways intersected the main one, the most significant one, one being 1432, or a rough north-south alignment. Uh, Tony, uh, thanks for being with us today and for sharing your interest in local aviation history. Um, you're working in aviation and you have been for a number of years. Can you give us a quick thumbnail sketch as to your aviation career and how it got started? Um, it goes back to 1986. Um, I started working in London. Um, I had been spent a little bit of time working with British Airways and I started really in Ryanair when they were formed. So um, I stayed with them for three years. That took me up to 1989 and joined Aer Lingus in 1989 and have been there since. Okay, when uh, did you first develop your interest in the history of the Shannon crashes and, and what, what was it that sparked off the interest in the first place? Um, Hard to pinpoint it because I've been interested in aviation since I was very, very small. Um, I had the good fortune to travel by air quite a bit when I was young because of my father's job. Um, and we had, had a lot of travel at a time when very few people travelled by air. And my father um, came originally from Cratlow um, and his, his parents had a pub there. And there was a lot of airport workers that used to come and go. And I remember my father's generation and my grandparents' generation talking about various aspects of life around Shannon, around the airport and the people that work there and one of the things was the crashes and just, it's just something that piques the interest of, of a young person um, and plus hearing first-hand accounts of the crashes that occurred at the airport back, going back from, as you say, 1946 right through, um, I think probably the most glorious one, the one that had the, the greatest kind of interest was the KLM mm -hmm. Triton that came down in the river in 1954. For some odd reason that the minute you uh, mention air crashes in Shannon the, the vast majority of people seem to focus on that one but I could never understand that because as we'll see there were several crashes. The crashes all occurred between 1946 to 1961 in other words a 15 year window. 
What do you think was the reason for the crashes in this time frame and why, thankfully, did it all stop in 1961? Well, the first crash was 1943, which was the BOAC aircraft that came down near the Honk. Um, but there were no fatalities. Now, the aircraft was d damaged beyond repair. But the first major crash was TWA, which was the flight that came in from Paris that crashed um, on the 28th of December 1946. But interestingly, all accidents occurred at night, generally in poor weather conditions. And most of it would have been down to um, lack of um, avionics approach systems um, and that sort of thing, and lack of um, visibility. There was no instrument landing systems back in not, those days? Well, there were, but they were very, very, very elementary, primitive. very primitive, yeah. Uh, okay. If we were to consider the five major incidents, so that would be TWA, Pan Am, KLM, Alitalia, President Airways. Which for you is the crash uh, that's of most interest and, and, and why would that be? The one that piqued my interest probably was Alitalia um, and probably because of the, the human factor. Um, I was I worked in Aer Lingus in Shannon for many, many years. Aer Lingus was the handling agent and down through the years, at the beginning of my career, and a lot of the older staff who were, who were long since gone had been on duty for a lot of the crashes and the one that they probably spoke the most about was the Alitalia because it occurred quite close to the airfield and there were a lot of survivors that were taken into the airport terminal building to await transportation onwards to the hospitals in Limerick and Ennis. So I spoke to a lot of people who had first-hand um, accounts of being on duty on the night. Mm, that's, just, that's very interesting. Um, I'm aware that the, there has been a memorial plaque uh, placed uh, at the Alitalia crash site, which is, uh, for anybody who doesn't know, it's the old Clonlohan um, uh, graveyard mm -hmm. uh, cemetery. Are there any other memorials or plans to place memorials that you know of? None that I know of. Okay. Other than um, locals, well-meaning locals who are interested in um, commemorating and remembering those who died in the accidents. But there are no memorials in place, as you say, other than Alitalia, and no plans to do so. And if you're going to place a plaque or a memorial, it, it costs, and it's, a lot of it's down to cost who's going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And nobody really wants to take charge of that because the airlines well, for instance, TWA and Pan Am are gone out of business, as is Alitalia. In fact, all of the airlines, like, apart from KLM, are gone out of out of business, and the airports themselves, for understandable reasons, don't like the negative press associated. Sure. Yeah, that is that's that's pretty understandable. Yeah. <clears throat> the first uh, crash that I really started researching in in, in any depth was the uh, uh, 1946 um, TWA Star of Cairo. Only in the last week did I find a photograph of an artifact, and that was a Tito. It was taken from the, the, the crash, that mm. particular crash site. Are you aware of, are you aware of any artifacts from this, this crash or have you ever seen anything over the years? I do remember, I remember the wing of the aircraft okay. out on Inish McNaughton Island. It was used as a bridge across a dike linking two fields. Wow. Um, as far as I know, the most of the wreckage is actually buried out on the island um, for many years it was on the surface but the landowners needed to use the land for for agricultural purposes so the easiest way to get rid of it was actually rather than go to the cost of cutting it up and transporting it because it had to be transported across a ravine was to actually bury it so as far as I know most of the wreckage of the constellation is buried out on Inish McNaughton Island. Yeah I, I've, I have very faint memories myself of being down that road with my father, and it must it must have been in the late 60s, early 70s, <laughs> and seeing bundles of wreckage out there. Um, so, uh, it, yeah, it it, uh, it it's a shame that uh, there was nothing uh, taken from it. Uh, I, I've come across the, the odd uh, old uh, newspaper. Uh, yeah, well, you have to remember that, you know, all of these accidents were huge human tragedies. There was a you know huge loss of life and. Um, people who were came upon the accidents, the rescue workers that came up were mostly airport staff, and they would all recall, you know, awful scenes of 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 just p 
pity and uh, suffering and people with you know horrific injuries some who and, and there were a lot of the accidents you know there were, it was huge loss of life and um, to come across that in, in as I say all of the crashes occurred at night and possibly the only light available to them apart from a small handheld torch or, a, or the light of a, a car or a truck would have been the light that was you know from the fire sure. the burning fuel so people were quick to forget and they, they forgot because they, they wanted to forget um, as for you know pieces of wreckage that were around the place they were all cleared up because all of the crashes apart from the KLM and the president as well they, they came down in agricultural land and the farmers wanted their land back and you know they didn't yeah, want was. sharp pieces of aluminium and that mm. you know snagging equipment or harming animals so you have to mm. remember you know that the recovery and people want life to go back to normal and just practicalities, forget and move on. Really, practicalities yeah. of it yeah I started uh, uh, my first research on <clears throat> the Star of Cara in uh, 2008 which is now 14, heading on 15 years ago, mm -hmm. and I was able at the time, uh, it, it was just through sheer persistence, to track down um, a lady, she was known as Vina Ferguson uh, at the time of the crash, and uh, she went on to, she survived it obviously, and she went on to marry a TWA pilot by the name of Heckman, and she was pretty surprised to receive a phone call all of those years on from Ireland, but the minute I mentioned the date, she had it straight away, mm. and her family were incredibly generous uh, towards me. So I, I, I obviously haven't spoken with the family in, in all of that time, but it was interesting. Um, if we could for a moment um, talk about the crash that, uh, as which I alluded to earlier on, that for some reason, the minute you mentioned air crashes in Shannon, that that's the one people jump towards. I'm obviously talking about KLM, the Triton. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think Triton in Greek mythology was the son of Poseidon or the twin, it's one or the other anyway. Mm -hmm. um, have you any uh, mem memories of talking to people about the KLM crash? Yes, uh, 1954, September 5th, it was a Sunday night. It's um, the month my parents got married. And um, the All-Ireland hurling final as far as I know had taken place that day. And the crash occurred at about three o'clock in the morning. The aircraft came in from Amsterdam, um, transiting through to New York. And there were a lot of lore, I suppose you could call it, among the staff in the airport who'd been on duty on the night time and, you know, different stories about the, 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 the turnaround of the aircraft. Um, back in those days, weight was a huge issue for the aircraft heading across the ocean. So they often had what they call transshipments. So in order for the aircraft to make it as far as possible without having to fuel, sometimes freight, mail, well not mail, mail was always the priority, but freight, baggage and passengers would have to be offloaded. So passengers would come in on different airlines flights to Shannon and be asked to step down for a day or two before they continued on their journey. But there was a, an Irish American who was trying to get on the KLM flight and he was insisting on booking a first class seat and there was no first class seat available on the flight it was it was the first class was was full and there was a dutch man walking around the airport and he heard this angry exchange taking place between one of my Aer Lingus colleagues and this american who was quite enraged that he couldn't have a first class seat so the dutch man feeling patriotic for his national airline offered to move to economy class so this gentleman could be accommodated and the first class section of the constellations was at the back because on the oh. piston driven aircraft the quieter was the part of the aircraft was at the back so this gentleman boarded quite happy and sat in the first class seat which was at the back of the aircraft and the dutch national moved forward and when the aircraft came down the back of the aircraft was broken by the impact and it flooded and all of the passengers seated at the back which were all of the first class passengers drowned and the gentleman from the Netherlands was fortunate enough to survive. Extraordinary story. Mm. Yeah, I think it came down, uh, I think it's referred to by the locals as midpoint, is it, it's literally a mud bank. Yeah. <coughs> right in the centre of the, um, yeah. the river. The wreckage at the aircraft, by the way, was um, <coughs> retrieved by KLM, mm -hmm. floated and pulled across the other side of the estuary to uh, Ring Moylan mm -hmm. uh, Pier, which is near Palace Kenry. Yeah. And I was told recently that the, the marks of the steel ropes are still visible yeah. on the concrete of the pier. Yeah. For a moment, uh, let's uh, focus on 
the final crash. So we're we're into 1961. Mm -hmm. um, so this is um, uh, President Airways. Mm -hmm. um, over the years, what have you kind of gathered on President Airways? President Airways was a bit of a fly-by-night operation. Um, a lot of airlines um, began with kind of shady beginnings back in that time and there was a large number of long-range piston aircraft coming on the market. Um, the jets, the 707s and DC-8s were starting to take to the skies and airlines were selling off these relatively new aircraft, DC-6s, DC-7s, Constellations, and airlines were beginning to see that it was lucrative to get into this transatlantic market because they were taking passengers away from the ships and the Americans were keen to travel to Europe. So President was one of these airlines that started up and it was run on a bit of a shoestring mm. and there would have been questions over the maintenance of the aircraft. and. As far as I know, President had two DC-6s. They were both bought from American Airlines, and the question, the aircraft in question, was known as it was named was christened the Theodore Roosevelt. That's right. Yeah. And it had started its journey in Düsseldorf in Germany, and was heading for Chicago, uh, routing through Shannon onto Gander, and then to Chicago. I heard along the way that there was an en route stop between Gander and Chicago to be made in New York, but the destination of the aircraft and its and its occupants was. Chicago and most of the passengers were German farmers who yeah, were going to, yeah. to an industry or farming um, exhibition in, in Chicago. And just ordinary people from various parts of Germany, just mostly male, um, came through Shannon on that fateful night. The was, weather was terrible, there was a very heavy fog down in the air, airport. And when the aircraft came in from Dusseldorf, um, it had a five hour layover because the crew that were taking it in Shannon had spent the previous minimum rest in the Old Ground Hotel Nanus and they had to get a, a legal rest. So they came back down to the aircraft and it, it, it was there for five hours. And nothing was moving that night. The fog, the airport was completely blanketed in fog. In fact, the staff that were at the boarding gate said it was almost impossible to see the aircraft out on the ramp. And people were surprised when they heard it starting up and taxiing out. And it just taxied off into the fog. Give it, got its takeoff clearance and the runway visibility was so poor that the captain actually requested from the tower that the runway lighting be turned up to full so that he could see the runway right. and very soon after becoming airborne the intended route across the Atlantic to turn right which was west to the west of the aircraft for She took reason. off on, on the old runway 23? 23, two, yeah. yeah. It became airborne on 23 <coughs> and um, went to the left and um, came down on its, its left hand side and it just cartwheeled and broke mm. up. Um, there was a survivor, one of the hostesses, one of the cabin crew survived. She was found in the wreckage. She was found kind of wandering aimlessly in the wreckage and she was taken into... That's unbelievable. Yeah, she was taken to the airport. Um, they didn't have a hospital there but they had a, like a first aid bay and Dr. Flynn was in attendance and they did all in their power to, to save her but unfortunately she died a few okay. hours afterwards. Okay, well, uh, that's that's all news to me. I never, mm. I never heard that before. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, I was um, I was having lunch with my wife recently in a, a place called it's near Bale Castle. It's a, a series of fishermen cottages that have been renovated as holiday cottages. But there's a, a pub and a new restaurant open there and. Only a week before that, somebody from that locality, I was talking about President Airways, said if you just look out to the right between that point and uh, Ring Moyle and Pier, which you can see in the distance, mm -hmm. somewhere about halfway along there, that's where it went in. Yeah, and it, it, it adds up because you're pretty much straight across from the airport. Yeah. And she did make that uh, severe left yeah, turn. Yeah, at a point known as the Silver Strand to the locals is where yeah. it came down. It was a few hundred year, meters out into the... Um, into the estuary, so when the tide was out, it came down on the mudflats, but the tide was actually in on the night, so it came down in water, and the wreckage then was discovered as the tide went out. Yeah, it's a, it's extraordinary all of these views on what you can learn from people mm. like yourself about Shannon Airport itself and, and, and the disasters. Uh, my earliest memories of Shannon were, were <coughs> being out with my dad, 
the back, we just call it the back of the jet mm -hmm. runway and watch the old 70s and, and the, uh, the VOAC 707s, Pan Am 707s, DC8s, mm -hmm. Air Canada. And then when the 747 came in, the early VOACs training mm -hmm. there, Aer Lingus, and to recognize then the, the difference in sound from a turbofan to a pure turbojet yeah, engine, yeah. or the other way around, I should say. It's just great memories of it there. Yeah. Um, just one thing out of just interest, a couple of years ago, and you probably already know this, just directly behind Shannon Aerospace, there is a, a gun pillbox. Oh, the gun posts, yeah. Yeah, and it's got a very long tunnel linking the two. Yeah. Um, so, Tony, uh, what can I say but uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's been most enlightening and uh, just a total pleasure talking to you about these events mm -hmm. and uh, certainly uh, you've unearthed facts that I hadn't heard before so uh, mm -hmm. this in my book is a, a very productive interview so okay. once again thank you very much and uh, maybe we'll talk again in the future sure. thank you cheers Tony TWA's constellation, Cairo Sky Chief, departed Paris Orly at 23.16 on a flight to New York via Shannon and Gander. The en route portion of the flight was uneventful and at 2 in the morning, Shannon Control Tower cleared the aircraft for approach to runway 14. At 2.06, the flight reported over the range station at 1,200 feet. At which time Shannon Tower advised it that Shannon was reporting 1010 10 cloud cover at 400 feet, visibility 1 mile, wind 120 degrees at 5 knots. While turning to the left for final approach to runway 14, the aircraft passed behind a low hill which blocked the airport lights from the pilot's vision. At the end of a left-hand turn to final, during this turn the aircraft lost at least 150 feet of altitude and the left wing tip struck the ground. The plane crashed and caught fire. Probable cause, an error in an altimeter indication, the primary reason for which was the reversal of the primary and alternative static source lines which led the pilot to conduct his report, approach to the airport at a dangerously low altitude. A contributing factor was the negligence of maintenance perso personnel in certifying to the satisfactory functioning of the static system, although the tests required to determine such a condition were not accomplished. A further contributing factor was the restriction of vision from the cockpit resulting from fogging of the unheated windshield panels. Some 18 months later, Shannon was yet to experience an even greater loss of life with the Pan American crash. NCC 88855 Pan American Flight 110 was transiting from London to Shannon as one leg of an around the world flight which had originated in San Francisco. 31 passengers and crew are on board the Empress of the Skies a newly built Lockheed Constellation. Before the end of the night, just one of these people would make it out alive. At 1.59, it reported to Shannon Tower that it was at the Limerick Junction marker. The flight received clearance for a landing on runway 23, but missed the approach and elected to go round again. On this second approach, it struck a stone fence 2,400 feet short of the main runway. The initial crash ripped the aircraft and its engines apart. The fuselage was ripped into three sections and a fireball ensued. The lone survivor was a Lockheed employee by the name of Mark Worst. Mark was Lockheed's former maintenance manager at Shannon and survived by literally falling through a break in the fuselage while everybody else perished in the intense fireball. Aiding him was the fact that he had undone his seatbelt in the moments before the crash. I was a little dazed but able to stand up and walk away. Unknown to Mark was that his wife was at the airport and joined rescue crews as they hurried out to the scene. On learning that there was just one survivor from 31 passengers and crew, she was literally dumbstruck 
when she realised shortly after that this, in fact, was her husband. American dead included 10 crew and 9 passengers. Other passengers were 5 Italians, 2 Indians and an 18-year-old British girl. During a night landing in Brussels, the lighting on the left side of the cockpit went out because of a faulty rheostat or dimmer switch. An entry describing the fault was duly placed in the aircraft's log. After landing, the problem seemed to resolve itself but then failed on its approach to London. To overcome the problem with the London landing, the crew used the cockpit chart light. On the ground, the London in London, the defect was detected, but they did not carry a spare cockpit illumination bulb. Of interest during researching this crash, I came across two references to a fire that night in which Shannon's ILS instrument landing system went down. Following the crash, a mass grave was prepared at Drumcliff Cemetery in Ennis. Over the years, the grave has been maintained by the airport police and fire service. The exact site of the crash is indicated by the satellite photo of runway 23 as shown here. Prior to its closing off, this section of the road was a haunt of aircraft enthusiasts as it puts you directly beneath the aircraft as they made their final approaches. KLM Flight 633 KLM Flight 633 was a passenger flight from Amsterdam to New York City. On the 5th of September 1954, immediately after taking off from Shannon Airport, the super constellation Triton ditched on a mud bank in the River Shannon. 28 people were killed in the accident and it was caused by an unexpected re-extension of the landing gear possibly compounded by pilot error. The Lockheed Super Constellation Triton was piloted by Adrian Verrilli, one of the airline's most senior pilots. After a refueling stop at Shannon, the plane took off for the transatlantic leg of the flight at about 2.40 a.m. There were 46 passengers and 10 crew on board. Shortly after takeoff, the pilot reduced power from maximum to METO or maximum except takeoff power. The pilot was unaware that the landing gear was not retracted and as a result the aircraft descended to touch down in the Shannon estuary. It turned around an impact and broke into two sections. The aircraft was partially submerged and at least one of the fuel tanks had ruptured during the crash. The fuel fumes rendered many passengers and crew unconscious, who then drowned in the rising tide. In the end, three crew members and 25 passengers perished. Even though the crash occurred less than one minute after the plane took off from Shannon Airport, airport authorities remained unaware of the disaster until the mud-caked third pilot, navigator of the aircraft, Johan Thiemann, stumbled into the airport and reported, we've crashed. That was two and a half hours after the plane fell. Mr. Tiemann had swum ashore and floundered painfully across the marshes to the airport, whose lights were clearly visible from the scene of the crash. It was not until seven in the morning, four and a half hours after the crash, that the first launch reached survivors who were huddled on a muddy flat in the river. The official investigation concluded that the accident was caused by unexpected re-extension of the landing gear and the captain's incorrect behaviour in this situation. Verily, who had been only one year from retirement, rejected the responsibility for the crash and was bitter about his subsequent treatment by KLM. In an interview, he later stated that there simply had not been enough time to react. The crash of Alitalia Flight 618 was an accident involving a Douglas DC-7C of the Italian airline Alitalia in Shannon, Ireland on the 26th of February 1960. Of the 52 people on board, only 18 survived with serious injuries. 
On the morning of 26th February 1960, Flight 618 arrived at its first stopover at Shannon Airport for refuelling in order to continue its journey across the Atlantic while under the supervision of a Czech pilot. The flight had been given permission to take off from runway 05 with a clear but still dark and partially overcast sky just 45 minutes after its initial arrival. Takeoff proceeded without issue and the crew retracted the gear before making a left turn when the aircraft climbed to a height of 165 feet, with the landing lights still on. While turning, the aircraft's power was reduced slightly, but the flaps were never fully retracted. Instead of climbing, the airliner only accelerated and lost altitude very quickly. The pilots were unable to prevent the left wingtip from striking a stone wall near the Clonlohan church followed by the left engines and the rest of the wing which also struck several gravestones of the surrounding cemetery. At this point the aircraft's fate was sealed after the propellers of the right engine also scraped past the wall. The outer controlled aircraft slammed into the ground in an open field beyond the cemetery and burst into flames. The post-crash fire quickly engulfed the aircraft and badly burned most of the survivors as local rescue workers arrived at the scene. The fire gutted the wreckage, leaving the tail section as the only recognisable part left of the aircraft. The crash also took its toll on the passengers and crew on board, with only a single crew member surviving the crash alongside 17 passengers who were all seriously injured. The Douglas DC-7C involved IDUVO, manufacturer serial number 45231, was built in 1958 and was used by Alitalia from 1958 to its destruction in 1960. The aircraft was destroyed by the impact and post-crash fire and the wreckage being documented on film and photography. An investigation of the accident revealed the aircraft speed at impact between 170 and 180 knots. Investigators failed to find any evidence pointing to the cause of the crash. The 1961 President Airlines Douglas DC-6 crash occurred on the night of September the 10th, 1961, when a President Airlines Douglas DC-6B named Theodore Roosevelt, outbound from Shannon, Ireland, crashed into the nearby River Shannon shortly after takeoff, killing all 83 people on board. To date, the crash remains the deadliest one in Irish territory. The aircraft involved in the accident was a Douglas DC-6B registered N90773 it first flew in 1953 and was powered by four Pratt & Whitney R2800 engines. The aircraft's occupants on the accident flight consisted of 77 passengers and six crew members. The passengers were mostly German farmers on their way to the US for a three-week study tour. The aircraft was on a non-scheduled international passenger flight from Dusseldorf, Germany to Chicago with stopovers in Gander, Newfoundland for refueling. Shortly after takeoff from Shannon Airport's runway 24, the pilots were cleared for a right hand turn, but instead turned left and kept turning until the aircraft had reached a bank angle of about 90 degrees or more. Unable to recover, the aircraft plummeted into the River Shannon 5,000 feet from the end of the runway. There were no survivors among the 83 passengers and crew. Subsequent investigations indicate that the crash probably resulted from a malfunctioning attitude indicator, a fault in the starboard ailerons or both. Poor weather conditions and crew fatigue were also cited as possible contributing factors.
Epilogue. It has been over 60 years since the final fatal crash at Shannon. Aviation is now an intrinsic part of our lives. The technology has marched onwards and we have safety levels that could only have been dreamed of back in those days. The next time you pass through the airport or drive the back roads which surround it or see an aircraft rise from its main runway, spare a moment to think of these ghost flights which never made it home. Thanks for watching this documentary and be safe.